here starting our activities. So. Actually, you're starting. Isn't yeah. it easy? We are, we are starting today no. and we had to wake up very early. Yeah, it's always the uh, baptism. The ba yeah. Baptism. <laughs> Baptism is great. Yeah, in fact, it was almost two years of work and we are starting now. It's not a forest, but uh, you cannot see a lot of trees. And uh, yeah, it's not, it's not densely populated. This is the countryside. We were thinking about doing today uh, four activities and tomorrow afternoon different four, four different activities uh, because with four, classes, yeah. with four different classes. By curiosity, how big are your student classes? You know how how many students? Oh, it's between six to five to about seven. <laughs> it's a huge class. We would like to start our first day with an opening talk where we introduce ourselves and talk about a bit of astronomy and what, uh, what is our project. Mm -hmm. And in the first day, if, if possible as well, we would like to carry out at the end of the activities a cafe scientific session, which mm -hmm. is also open for, uh, for the full school. So who are we? We are Galileo Mobile. And me and my colleagues are here in representation of this group, uh, which is international in the sense that we are spread all around the world. As you could see, we all belong to different countries. And we came here to Uganda for the first time to talk about a special science. It's the science who studies the cosmos, the universe. Since I'm a kid, I've always been very passionate about science, about astronomy, about physics. And when I begin to travel across the world, especially in South America, I thought this is something I want to share. Galileo Mobile is a purely non-profit science education program and we try to bring science or more specifically astronomy to people around the world mainly to those regions or across those regions that do not have access to uh, outreach programs this is the main goal actually the earth I have to tell you is just like some of the objects that you can see at night time, night time in the sky and these objects are called planets. There is a quite luminous whitish stripe in the sky. This is called Milky Way. This Milky Way is say a collection of stars and it's called galaxy. If I jump down here, I see a white stripe of all of you. And you can be my Milky Way. And I am on Planet Earth, Uganda, Bale, and I see my Milky Way. I started having this passion since I was little. Since a telescope, like, seem very similar to the ones that we are uh, giving as gift to the schools we're visiting, was given to me as gift. I was eight, and I started to be quite interested in the sky. Astronomy helped to inspire people. In general, people tend to be really curious about astronomy, about the sky, about the planets, about life in other places of the solar system. It's a very appealing science because it's very visual and it immediately fascinates kids and people in general. It's a perfect ambassador of science because it's so visual and it mixes many science together. We talk about geography, physics. But the idea is not to teach astronomy. The idea is to use astronomy as a tool to engage, especially the students and people in general, in science. Apart from us, on the other planets, do people exist? And if not, why? And if so, why? And does the wishing star... People speak about the wishing star, but does it exist or it's a planet? On the other seven planets on the solar system, no life has been found. The most likely reason is that uh, these planets have not good conditions for hosting life. The other question was about the wishing star. Uh, if I well understood, 
what you mean with wishing star is shooting star. So these stars, these things that sometimes you see in the sky, like very luminous star going very fast in the sky. Uh, shooting star was actually it's one of the phenomena in the sky that uh, impressed me the most when I was a teenager. Actually among my friends, I was the expert, so-called say expert, uh, but I was always the one who saw less shooting stars than the others. <laughs> you know, in every moment I was trying to concentrate on the sky while other people were probably playing guitars or doing uh, whatever they, they want. And then I was not able to see shooting stars and friends saying, oh look, shooting star. And say, where? So maybe they saw 10 shooting stars and I saw only one. And they were also doing, uh, they were much more relaxed than me. And actually, yeah, this was happening when I was 14, it's still happening now. Galileo Mobile is not um, an official institution in the sense that we are not registered anywhere, we don't belong to any country. We are just a group of colleagues. It's a project which actually runs uh, and depends on the will of the people who are actually working on this. So all team members, they are volunteers and they come from different parts of the world all with the same spirit of bringing astronomy and sharing what we know from these places that we reach. In 2009 came the International Year of Astronomy. So when I saw this coming, I thought, what about doing a project to share science, but especially astronomy? And I sent an email to a huge network of PhD students that was in Germany, where I was at that time. And to my surprise, because I was looking for crazy people for a long time, but many crazy people appeared, suddenly. And we all started to meet, like this, without knowing anything about each other. We had no money, no support, we just had an idea. We thought that we would do this project or this expedition only once. But after we finished that work, that expedition in South America, we decided like to go on, move on, and try other places and visit other countries too. So this guy is going to all the park. That is a problem. This expedition started um, to be planned more or less one year and a half ago. We started to organize an expedition between Uganda, Kenya and Ethiopia, but there were security problems and at the end uh, we only focused in Uganda.
So the first week we stayed in Kampala, we visited three schools, Nadeje Secondary School, uh, San Kisito Secondary School and Nabisunsa Girls. protects the rights of individuals, corporations, and states. The second week, uh, we decided to go up country. We came to Mabale, and we managed to visit two more schools. Mabale Secondary School and Manafa uh, High. I've not had any person studying astronomy in Uganda so far. But I think, of course, as the generation is developing, maybe it's we, the new generation, to bring it up and to develop. Of course, now uh, during the curriculum, they have introduced astronomy, but of course, as we shall be moving out of school. And meaning the younger generation coming in, it's the one which will be studying astronomy. The education system does not have any reference to astronomy from the start. So you find that, um, you know, people uh, don't have like the, the right material, which if they did, they would actually be very interested in astronomy. There's no cause for astronomy because astronomy is seen as something that really does not render a lot of profit. So, so for a country, I think they're trying to focus on courses that actually have profits out of them. The little that people are, are actually uh, getting to, to learn now is just through like movies. I've had like several people talk about asteroids just because they watched science fiction movies, you know, like Armageddon or Deep Impact. So that's how it... <laughs> there is a radio program on some radio station that I used to listen to when I was a young girl and they would just talk about the stars those other planets, the aliens, about those ones. I would really like to believe that they exist, but I don't know. I used to watch movies when, since I was growing up. And I used to see people in space, people flying. Then I, I, I would imagine how, you know, how it would be. You know, I would buy some pics. I have, I have some, you know, this Superman, the, you know, those guys flying in air. It's difficult, but it's also rewarding to be an astronomer in, in Uganda. It's uh, a bit difficult to have programs running and, you know, collaboration and things like that. The way it's, it's rewarding is the fact that you are in that position whereby you can reach out to people and uh, you, you talk to them about astronomy, you spread, you spread the science. Um, that makes it rewarding. So 
education in Uganda is still it's not doing very badly but I think there's a lot of issues uh, surrounding education there are a lot of challenges first of all um, one challenge is that of maybe resources uh, but the second challenge is also the, is to do with the methodology a lot there's no so much experimentation discovery inquiry we have realized that the reception from the students is fantastic uh, we they have tons of questions all the time all different so they are very curious about the science i believe that all these young children have a lot of capacity to, to, to be creative and innovative and to even learn a lot on there on if you use the right methods In our team we have different task forces, so right now I'm, I'm responsible of one task group that works in developing activities that are suitable in the classroom everywhere in the world. So these are activities that come from various excellent sources that were existing on the web already, but we took these ideas and we enhanced them, um, oftentimes using methods from inquiry, that is that we want the students to make practical activities that are hands-on such that they can learn by doing for instance building a sundial and using the rotation of the earth and the apparent motion of the sun to record the time passing and all our activities also use cheap materials that's so important because we want the activities that we develop to be doable everywhere in the world in order to be a global project and to share this resource so here are the drawings that Galileo Galilei did with his telescope. And he observed the planet Venus, so five times, with an interval of time of several months between them, okay? If we look at these drawings, these are our only observations. What is different from one drawing to the next, if we examine them? The shape is changing. Mm -hmm. And the size, very good. So this activity they were teaching us, they were, we were finding out whether Venus rotates around the Earth or it, ro it rotates around the Sun. Close one eye and just leave one eye open, okay? And try to block me with your thumb. I'm going to move now. You're seeing me smaller, right? And keep, keep, keep doing it. And now, what is happening? Yeah, Galileo Mobile is one of the projects eh, that is trying to uh, elucidate, eh, trying to, to make the science of the universe simpler and understandable. No moon. No moon. I can't see. Yeah, we call it new moon. Exactly. This is what happens. Let's keep on. Uh, because one of the questions that uh, learners ask is. Uh, Will the sun burn out? Hmm? How is the earth related to the stars? What are the stars? What about these falling bodies? Uh, you know, time travel? So many of their questions are about the universe. Some kids were asking me, but to measure, what about um, the possibility to measure the distance between the earth and the sun? Do you really need to go to the sun to measure that? So in this sense, astronomy really stimulates curiosity. And stimulates curiosity because you can achieve um, big results with really few tools and basic tools. One thing we often try to do with them is to find out a little bit about the shape of the Earth orbit, for instance. Most people say it's circular, but how do we know? This is often the missing question in school. How do we know what we know? We know because we investigated with some data, some observations, and possibly some modeling with them. So we give them actual images of the sun, actual data, and they can make measurements with these to test hypotheses that they can make. So this leads them to discussions, very interesting discussion between them. It was first January. Yes. And we chose a sport 
um, of first January, which was, uh, for example, 11640. Yes. And um, on the 2nd of January, the spot had moved a little bit. If you get to notice on your papers, it had moved a little bit um, to, towards the, the right. The right, yes. And um, the following day on 3rd, 11640 had moved further to the right. Yes. So it keeps on moving. You just choose one spot, and if you get to notice the pattern, it keeps on revolving around. It's about finding out things that surround us. And oftentimes the way you find out is by investigation, inquiry. And when you found a possible answer is never definite. You never find the truth. There is always discussion. You, you can always go beyond. Astronomy has been demystified by these practical activities that we have in the school. You already saw that Mercury, which was really tiny, less than one millimeter, was 10 meters away from the sun. So maybe we cannot fit the full solar system inside the school. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so let's leave the sun here in the gates. And do you still remember how many meters? Ten. 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 So let's count. One. Ten steps. Okay, from here, let's count ten steps. Yeah. Okay, let's do. One, two, three. We have learned that students really like to learn the science outside the classroom. Six, seven, eight. So this is how Venus <laughs> looks like. So how about the next? So the next is the earth. The earth, very well. Yes. You said six was close by. Seven steps. I remember there was one student who said to one of the astronomers, I wish every day was like this. And that means a lot in the life of a student. And before we keep going, let's all look behind and see What's the size of the solar system so far wow. until Mars? And don't forget, our planets are so tiny like this, okay? okay. Our Earth is like this. Can you see it there? Yes, yes. yes. Which is the next planet? Which one is the following planet? Jupiter. Jupiter. Can you imagine? How far is Jupiter? How many steps? 20 steps, you say. I say it's more than that. More than 20, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, more than 30. Can we help you? 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 70, 70, more than 70. Someone said 100, 100, 100, a bit less. 92. 92 meters. So let's see if we can count 92 steps. I'm not sure anymore. Otherwise, we have to turn around the building probably. Yeah. 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 Just have to imagine. But when we arrive at the corner there, let's take a perspective. Okay. Anyway, and then we continue. So let's try to count 90 steps. Okay. Okay, let's go. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. When it comes to physics, you just like explain to, they tell you planets, they tell you all sorts of things, but then here we get to see them practically. We followed the activity, we've been in class discussing with, with Fabio, we've been able to know which month really the sun is near the earth and which month really the sun is far away a bit from the earth. Like you said, on January, the sun is somewhere near, uh, not, not so far. I'm trying to tell that I'm using the paper. We have to point exactly to the north, and we see where the shadow of the pencil will lie. And using this paper, if you see the marks, it will show us where the time is. From here, we have to look for where our north, which is around the other side. So if you try to point the pencil exactly to the north, 
we shall sh see our shirt which is like at 320 or 330 something like that <laughs> oh my goodness, subhanallah. No, smile, so stop loving seriously, Henry. I've never put it in the time. What is it? Between three and two. Our time is wrong. <laughs> the Gadeo Mobile has come in with, with a telescope. Uh, these are not common uh, gadgets or instruments in, in secondary schools. I'm actually, I actually view the space from satellite images via the internet. Yeah, there is the Hubble Space Telescope and it's taking images and yeah, that's why I actually get the view of space. But I don't have telescope or anything. And also there's a lot of information on the net about the universe. And we teach very little, unfortunately, in the classroom about the universe. Though we teach the principles that explain the universe, but we just leave them hanging. We just teach the mathematical part how you solve distances and so on, but we don't go to practical part of it, observing the universe, you know, drawing the universes, understanding the galaxies and so on. So those questions remain in the minds of learners throughout their school time and actually get out of school without understanding it. The goal is to observe the sun on this piece of paper and to see if we can find some structures. So just from observations. So please remove the cartoon. Here we are looking at the sun using this method that is called solar projection. So, but you say, okay, there is a spot on the sun, then, or wherever, it should be maybe something in the atmosphere, but it's always there. So if it would be in the atmosphere, at some point it will be moving. There are scientists uh, investigating on this, and nowadays the full explanation is not known yet. But what has been found is that, first of all, these spots are darker than the rest of the sun, because they are colder. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you know how big is one sunspot? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any guess? Maybe, okay. maybe the size of the Earth. The size of the Earth? Yeah, maybe, or the Moon. No, the Earth, thanks. Yeah. It's the size of the Earth. It's approximately the size of the Earth. So it's like a Earth is moving on the surface of the Sun and then it disappears. So it's a super big structure that is born and after less than 30 days, disappear. When I think of space, I feel little. I feel like I'm really young and because the space is actually very old. So I feel new and I feel any time I could, I could even, you never know, I could even get, you know, extinct from space because we have stars exploding. We have a lot of activity taking place. So. Basically, I feel small and little in space. So I want really to thank you because you have been amazing. You have found actually three sunspots. I actually was able to find only one. So congratulations. Yes. Questions? Well, you know more than me, so. We really love astronomy, but we had never gotten such a chance. I'm lucky to have like learned how to use a telescope. That is something nice to just watch it like in the movies oh okay i find it as something very good because i get to know what is beyond studying what's beyond just books because when it comes to to, to to the telescope it does not deceive what that's what i believe because it brings exactly what is in the sky i learned something about those uh, telescope and i couldn't believe a telescope can see something which is 300 kilometers away from a planet and right now at sir, I was able to show us a sun, sun from a distance on the heart. So I, I could not believe, right now I can believe that it's very possible to use a telescope to see something above the heart. So their presence here is just like a jubilee to me.
get to see the four moons that uh, Galileo Galilei observed. And they are called Galilean moons, <laughs> just because he was the first person who observed. So with this telescope, you'll see Jupiter like this, and you see also the moons orbiting around the planet. They are four. It's a very beautiful image also. All the activities we develop are actually freely available on the internet. They are compiled into a handbook, practical handbook, which is convenient for teachers to read and use in their classroom. After the 2009 expedition, we realized that there was a strong necessity to involve strongly also the teachers in our action. Because of course, when we go around, we meet students, we throw a seed in a field and maybe this seed one day will grow up. But it's important that we try to train also the local farmers to be able to cultivate this seed, to be able to protect this seed. And here, at the end, they tell you the extra steps, how to mount these lenses you're saying, right? Even how to point the telescope, everything is here. So in fact, uh, we were totally useless today because you can also find the things. But anyway, we had a, r a real pleasure uh, to share, you know, telescope manipulation with you. It was really nice. And the teachers' workshop they consist in an introduction to the donation material, because in each school we visit, we leave a telescope, a tripod, um, some other resources, uh, more like books and educational material. So we get the chance to the teachers to be the first one to actually see this material. And we do so because we believe that the teachers are the most important connection. It's very hard actually to work with the students and then just like leave the country and leave them by themselves. The teacher workshops we have been carrying out are endorsed by the Galileo Teacher Training Program, uh, which is an international organization. And with these workshops, uh, we try uh, to introduce new techniques of teaching. Uh, that does not mean that the, the techniques that have been used by the teachers are wrong or that ours are best. It's just these are different approaches. One thing that this uh, Galileo Mobile team has impressed me a lot about is uh, the inquiry-based learning. That the, you, you develop the inquiry of the child uh, instead of telling him facts. And as the name suggests, we have like to be asking questions to the students and they have like to raise some hypotheses and try to come with an idea on how you should measure or understand this phenomenon. Teachers, they have constantly to ask questions and then in the end, the students have to think about an experiment to test the hypothesis and then they conclude and discuss the results between themselves. When you are the one who have discovered this, what has already been discovered, but you rediscover it yourself, you understand it better. Even though actually speaking specifically about Uganda, uh, they don't have astronomy in their school programs. They can use these activities to teach other things related to, the, to their subjects. I don't think it's going to be a drop in the ocean. I think it's going to facilitate other similar activities that will be related to astronomy. Astronomy is now going to be part of the school curriculum. And so this is such an opportunity.
Ivy. Ivy. Like Irene. French. This is the place. This is good. Oh, <laughs> you're a good student as well. Galileo Mobile is um, about sharing. And that's the reason why Galileo Mobile is um, an itinerant project. Uh, that we get to go to places and teach some basic concepts of astronomy and physics. But also we learn. And an important aspect of this project is that at the same time we go and we, we reach these people and we try to learn a bit of them, we try to bring to other places what we have learned. The best way to impart knowledge or to someone else is not by you showing that you're knowledgeable or that you're a teacher. One of the things that I always tell students whenever I talk to them is that astronomy is one of those few st subjects where you can ask me a question and I, and I can say, I don't know the answer. Without feeling bad. <laughs> you know, so... What I learned from them a lot is their spontaneity in asking questions. And most of all, I think one of the things that surprises me probably most is to which point they give value to learn about science, to open their mind, to discover. For them, it's really, it makes their day to a point that I wouldn't even have imagined before. And here, especially in Uganda, it's extremely strong. Nobody owns knowledge um, and nobody knows everything. But uh, you must have something to share with people and then people contribute. And, and learning, is, is, they say it's not so much about teaching but about learning and somebody learns more when he's engaged. No one knows everything about astronomy, so we are all learning. And the best approach is to, to talk to people and to share that. We just think that science can help a lot to develop uh, the critical thinking. Because all the time, when you try to analyze a phenomenon in the sky or, I don't know, in medicine, in biology, you always raise questions first. So we believe that science and astronomy can help the students to think critically. In Switzerland, the Sun, what, Sun organization, where they make that experiment of how the Big Bang Theory yeah, took place, and they show how antimatter and matter co what collided, collided and formed the universe. And where was the matter coming from? Antimatter can't. It's called antimatter. It destroys matter. It destroys everything. If you put one drop eh, of antimatter, if you release it, you know even air is matter. It just goes destroy. It destroys it, destroys it, and destroys its whole thing. The precipitation of your DNA, now like maybe the precipitation of DNA to that of apes, they are close, they so close what? Yeah, Relationship. Yeah. So meaning that you are close to the what? The apes. Scientifically they say that our closest DNA relations, we are so close to slugs. Our DNA is more similar yeah, than slugs. Yeah, they say it's slugs. How can it's you tell me? Apes. But it's apes. But no, no, my apes. talk about uh, that when you have sex with an infected person, eh? Uh, who has let me who has let me say like AIDS, eh? It changes the DNA. It changes the DNA of the blood of that person. So I was asking something about that. It's impossible. No, it's impossible. it doesn't. That, that, no. I've never heard of... It affects only blood. Yeah, virus, the, the, the virus simply deals with blood. It does not go into DNA. Or you see, it's like simply this. deals with... I mean, that is changing and direct that. Now you, are, you become the what? The host. Mm. No, that's parasite. Direct that's white blood cell to produce what? Virus of the same kind. Yeah. That's maybe what you're yeah, trying to get yeah. into that AIDS was created just by America. an American. <laughs> it's a funny, funny thing. It was just created. It, it was manufactured. How can something prune out of nowhere and then, palm? it's in humans? I think it was... It came in 19. I think it was made for some weird purpose. You don't only deal in one sector, but you also got to know what's happening around. So that is something great. Yeah, expanding knowledge, getting to know 
because the fact that you're a student doesn't mean that you're supposed to only read books, books, books. You're supposed to, at least, like for instance, we are advised to like empower ourselves when it comes to talent. We are supposed to work on that. And you're supposed to be also on the music side. It doesn't necessarily mean books. So likewise, it doesn't mean we should only be concerned now like for instance me it doesn't mean that I should only be concerned about education and being a doctor but also to know more what's happening what is yet to happen everyone in the earth is supposed to know what goes around and what what happens around the earth because this is our land where we live so you have responsibilities it's not optional it's compulsory if you Open your mind because of the because of being exposed to the grandeur of the universe. If you become a critical thinker, whatever you do in your life, this will be such useful tools for you. And so never accept a thing as a granted just because it was told you or because you found it in a book. Always think about it. Because you might find different answers, different possibilities. So I think definitely these are ingredients that can change the world. Stars, when they die. They release their material into space. This is stardust. <laughs> okay? Yes. Then from stardust, other stars are born and can create other materials and release more stardust into space. And from this stardust is made all the elements, chemical elements of your body. I had a very interesting question one day. A student asked us, asked me, well. My teacher from religion told me that we were made from ground material, from dust. But actually now I learned that the universe is so old and, and that we come from maybe material that is made in stars and he was very completely destabilized. According to some books that I've read, God created the sun, man, stars, and man was created according to God's image. Then how comes does this star, really the particles are forming uh, tiny molecules onto man, that man is formed from the, dose, uh, from the dust that was eroded from the dead stars. So it really beats my understanding. I really, I get so confused. There are tricky situations, but uh, um, the one thing that I look at whenever I talk about astronomy is to try and raise their interest and I do neglect certain areas which tend to conflict with what the students uh, like know, especially when it comes to religion. It's just about the delicate balance of, of just finding the right point whereby you, you keep everyone happy. <laughs> Maybe there was a god that created a universe containing physical laws that would govern the motion and the association of matter such that it would produce star that would you know produce new elements and so on and so on and all this was somehow injected into the universe by some god it could be some very intelligent god you know someone who would just <laughs> yeah, yeah. heart is not a wonderful one, oh God, Jesus. This heart is not a pure one, oh God, Jesus. Father, I am impure in my heart, oh God, Jesus. The way I pray, oh God, may you control them with the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it's very, very important for young people and young people in Uganda to question these things, even to question this faith, because, you know, like, not to believe blindly, because you... A human being naturally is, is, is meant to be curious, you know, to discover things. I think, actually, I think searching for the origin of the universe is, is like the most motivate, the most, the, the real reason why scientists are doing whatever they are doing. They are searching for the origin. Yeah, it's a very big question, the origin of the universe. It has two versions where religion says the earth was made by God and scientists do say it came to exist just like that. And who is right? Pardon? Who is right? 
Well, according to me, I think it's God who is right, but if I'm strolled back to the side of science, I think science is right because tracing our history and our origin, we don't know how God came into existence, but at least we do know how the planet do, did come to what existence by it exploding. Yeah. By nature, religion teaches. By nature, science learns. I think this is a big difference between both fields. But it's not impossible to coexist. I, I can tell you that most of my colleagues, scientists, colleagues, they believe in something that created the universe. We don't want like to uh, step on their beliefs. The approach is to, to say that science is actually here to try to prove or disprove things that we can actually measure and do experiments. As I said, at divinity, they say that God created everything, initiated everything, but the origin... But I believe scientists, because you believe by seeing, not by details, where they say that God did this, did this. Uh, I think science only uh, provides the, 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 meth the method, the method by which these things have been created, but doesn't contradict the reason for creation. At the end of the day, for him, a million years is equivalent to a day. So even if we say that evolution has taken very many years, possibly for him is counting it as a day. And Lubova Bob. Dennis, I think. We are spread across the world. We are a team worldwide nowadays. 20 people in Portugal, Brazil, Switzerland, Germany, Spain. Well, I'm forgetting many people, but we are very much spread. So we have to use internet to connect each other. And even more, I would say, to keep on with the project, to keep on with contact with the schools we visit. While at the beginning uh, Galileo Mobile was, was mainly based in uh, Munich, uh, now Galileo Mobile members are spread all around the world. Also an expedition like this, um, it's very important to strengthen the friendship between us. Because now we are mainly sharing um, the passion for the project, now we are mainly sharing the organization, and well, we will spend hours speaking about how to improve uh, our action. So in this sense, we are really focused on, what, on our work. And there is almost no space for relax, for uh, jokes. Well, for jokes, there is always space, actually, I have to say. Hey, is it there? Well, normally, it should be, I mean, it should be here. That's what they should see from their perspective. I never saw a rainbow so low. But so close, actually. Yeah, so close is so low. I never saw it before. OK, we are now under the same rain. <laughs> <laughs> It should be here, no? Yeah, but somebody robbed it. Sometimes I believe that these experiences change more our lives than the lives of the students and teachers. Because since we, we managed to get so close to the locals, this really means something to us. Otherwise, we would not be doing this project. None of us knows or have a clear idea about the future of Galileo Mobile. But we know that we want it to live, to keep going. Galileo Mobile has changed a bit since uh, it started in 2009, so it's difficult, it's very hard to predict how it's going to be in 10 years, let's say. Speaking for myself, uh, what I can say is that I hope I can be part of it in 10 years. Our best expectation is probably that the people locally where we go, want to carry on what we're doing, that they share our project and feel identified with it so much that they want to do it themselves in their country. I had high school students yesterday that came to me and said, look, we want to do Galileo Mobile Uganda. And for me, it's the best 
thing I could ever expect. I never expected that, in fact. So it was beyond all expectations. I feel jubilated and I was so interested to hear about them and to hear from them. And I feel that I should be with my career in such a way that I also do the same with them. I should move away, far away from Uganda and I go to dozens to also tell people that science is real. I like it so much. I even mean, I would like to be one of the members to, to play the, the activity around. I would like to be the member. It's so nice. There are people who actually care to inspire. Who imagine moving thousands of miles, you come and then inspire other people. That's so great. Yeah, it's very good. Definitely, uh, I believe there are a lot of questions running inside their mind. And I can say that uh, Galileo Mobile has provoked for us big questions which uh, unfortunately are going to go away and we have to answer them uh, from the students. But uh, I would think it is better for the mind to be provoked and have questions other than the mind to sleep. O quadro que a gente tem aqui é, mostra algumas palavras relacionadas com a astronomia. Escritas em inglês, que é uma língua oficial no Uganda, toda a gente entende. E on aimerait que les, les enfants viennent ici et que dans les différentes langues qui correspondent à leur tribu ici en Uganda, et même on va essayer en la langue de Somalie, qu'ils traduisent. Que no Uganda existem cerca de 65 tribos e cada uma tem a sua própria língua. On en prend ici seulement 7, mais dans ces 7 langues. Ils vont être capables tous d'avoir des mots communs qui représentent des objets dans le ciel ou des choses symboliques liées au ciel. Cette fois, nous traduirons de l'anglais, à Lugisu, Lugnole, Japadola, Karamayong, Somali, Samia et Aleso. À la fin de la journée, demain, enregistrer ces enfants qui vont prendre le micro et parler leur propre langue à eux de leur tribu en traduisant tous ces noms. La chose intéressante est que cette fois, nous avons essayé de mettre les paroles d'une hein, manière telle de pouvoir euh, guider. Et je vais Un moment, s'il vous plaît. Juste deux minutes et puis vous pouvez commencer. Merci. Et beaucoup de fois, euh, ces paroles ne peuvent pas être traduites. Comme par exemple, la propre parole astronomie. Elle existe apenas en algum, alguns idiomas. Mas existem outras palavras que são comumente traduzidas porque todas as pessoas observavam os céus, como por exemplo estrelas ou sol. Estrela, dia, night, night, noite, <risos> fino a nós mesmos, então sobre o nosso planeta. A vida, o ser humano, nosso planeta e o nosso motto, under the same sky. Sob o mesmo céu. Sob o mesmo céu sob o mesmo céu. translate uh, these words from English to Japadola. It says, Sta it's muchala. Esta in Lugisu is inyanyesi. The sun, inyanga, moon, gumwesi. Then eclipse, we always said that inyange hupana nikumwesi. That for us we say like that because the traditional we think the Sun is fighting with the moon. The galaxy is enyonyoz ninja. Okay, we, we really don't have the right word, but <laughs> we just gathered something. I, you can see the galaxy is a collection of stars, so it's many stars. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sun, chain. Star, la kala tue. Wow. <laughs> 
So, who is going to read? Can you tell me how do you say it's Runi and Poli? But the eclipse is called the Chibunom, it's called Chibunom. Then tell us, Scott, is Achumanai. <laughs> no, okay, tell us, Scott, is Achumanai. Can anybody speak Italian? <laughs> Bejour. Night, no it. Rainbow is um, Arc en ciel. Very good. Earth, Esialo. Human, Omundu. Life, Ovalam. Star is Stella. <laughs> Planet is Vimwe. Astronomy is Astronomia. And we say Astronomia. <laughs> Tell me it's not more beautiful that way. And at the same side is Pin Macha Legipolo. As we see Alo. Kwapna Kuch Adio. About the sentence of uh, of this group, Galila Mobile, which says under the same sky, in in Lugisu we say Haseli Kuruli Twera. You see, <laughs> it's quite funny, but in, I like it because it's my language. Under the same sky. Okay. Um. Oh, under the same. In my opinion, it's like it's it's it sounds like something that that unites us. It's a sense of unity because we are all under, we are all, it's like, we are all the same because we are all under one thing. And the sky is the same everywhere. I mean, even if you're in Canada or you're in the US or you're in England or in Uganda, South Africa, you'll still see the same sky. Under the same sky means that everything in this universe has a common origin. We are a very small part of the, the universe, so we, we are all... Um, looking into whether you're in Europe or whether where you, you are looking into the sky. The best we can give you is a flower to go back with. Grow the flowers. Okay. We are under the same sky and uh, we are one people. You cannot say that uh, because I am from, uh, I'm a Muslim or I'm a Protestant, therefore I have my own sky. It's not possible. It's like the universe is our global home. We have some common values. We have some common interests. Our source to live is the sun. And you can't tell me that the sun is only in Uganda, in Africa. It also flows to Canada. So that brings us together. Under the same sky meant that we need to be accommodative to each other. We need to be accommodative with other <laughs> organisms apart from the human beings. Although the world is divided by borders and there are around 200 countries in the world, there is something which is unique and belongs to everyone. And it's impossible to create borders there, which is the sky. It means that we can still be in touch and we can still have some dialogue and speak about the things we don't know about each other. When I go traveling and meet students all around the world, I really feel under the same sky with them. I am at ease with them. I have fun with them. I can interact with them spontaneously. And this is the most important aspect of to be under the same sky. To be able to be free and act spontaneously in a natural way. So I think when you share sky with people, you really create a bond that is not only a bond of knowledge, of you knowing same things as me, and me learning from you, and lo you learning from me. It's really a human bond. Because we dreamed together during a moment, we wandered together during a moment, we were curious, we opened our mind to each other. And this is beyond science, this is already something that is purely human. <laughs>